Thanks so much, and uh, thanks for choosing to attend this stream. We collectively, as the presenters of this stream, think it's the most intellectually stimulating, so uh, I've got to keep up the tra tradition of the panel before me. And uh, I will pick up, uh, as is my, uh, my role, uh, with my higher education standards panel hat on, I will pick up on Phil's comment about the standards. And uh, there's always room for improving on those standards, Phil. So if they're not quite adequate, maybe uh, maybe we can review and revise them. But um, seriously, the uh, the focus for today is to bring you up to speed on some of the work that we've been doing around admissions transparency. And there will be some juicy bits at the end looking at some of the emerging practices and your input on that. So that'll be the discussion point. But um, I do come to you with my higher education standards panel hat on. There has been quite a bit in the higher ed standards um, area since 2016, in fact, looking at admissions into higher education providers, universities, public and uh, independent providers, looking at ways to bring about greater transparency. So for those of you who are new to this space or perhaps aren't particularly familiar with the Australian context, I will give a quick whirlwind tour of what we have been doing in this sector since 2016. But very quickly, I'll move on to the, uh, the focus for today, which is, first of all, to bring you up to speed on the feedback that we've had from you as sector representatives around some proposals for doing further work on postgraduate and international admissions transparency. And then I will conclude with, uh, as I said, the juicy bits, which is really what are some of the emerging admissions practices? Do we need to be concerned about any of these? Should we be celebrating them? What are the implications? And I will make a link to the higher education uh, universities um, uh, accord, the review process that uh, has been mentioned already this morning by the minister and by Glyn Davis. This, I think, uh, intersects very well with one of the key areas, and I'll come to that in just a moment. So here's the whirlwind tour. Since 2016, over the last six years or so, we have been looking at how we bring about greater transparency in the higher education admissions process. And um, I'll talk about some principles underpinning that work in just a moment. But you can see there, between 2017 and uh, 2020, all of us in the Australian higher ed sector were involved in um, agreeing to uh, a core set of information, what we call information sets, specifically for undergraduate students coming into higher education. And the goal was to figure out how we agree on a core set of information, consistent language that would be in the interests of helping students to uh, transition into higher education uh, with uh, as fully formed and informed a view as possible. Of course, the implications here are also for those who advise students, careers advisors play a key role, uh, as well as parents, community members, etc. So the idea here was to uh, look at a whole of sector approach, and all of us achieved that. Texa took a close look, and they said, um, Implementation was a little patchy, but all providers did a best endeavours uh, effort to bring about information sets. And um, Course Seeker was also introduced, and we've got um, uh, colleagues from the Department of Education here who were um, key to harvesting that information that resulted from the work on admissions transparency, those information sets that core information that we all provided and uh, that populated course seeker which we currently have in, in place. What uh, has followed uh, in 2021 and uh, is in train right now is what I call stage two. So stage one, we're, we're in train, we all still provide those core information sets on our websites and uh, stage two was about doing two things. First of all, going out to you as sector representatives to say, is there a way for us to augment what we currently do, not only for undergraduate students, but for postgraduate and international students? And so we went out to the sector with a consultation paper, and I'm here to give you a quick snapshot and a synthesis of what you fed back to us as a panel, and uh, I'll give you the, um, my assessment of what we're hearing and then uh, we will lead into the focus on 
uh, the, the last stage of, of this work around emerging practices. So today, all I'm going to do is focus on those two things um, that you see circled there. An important point in terms of the status of this, this commentary I'm making, this is um, my assessment uh, with the help of department colleagues who have analysed your submissions. Um, and I'll share with you the recommendations that I will be making to the Higher Ed Standards Panel based on your feedback. But just to be clear, the way these things work, uh, the recommendation goes to the Higher Ed Standards Panel. We meet on Monday to discuss that. I'll let you know what I'll be recommending. And then, depending on the outcome of that, the Higher Ed Standards Ooh. Panel advises the Minister. Right? So basically we ask the question, are there any implications here for amending our current higher education standards framework? Anything need to change? And importantly, are there any practices that need to change across the sector to achieve greater transparency? So that's the end goal, but we're simply at the point of me sharing with you recommendations that um, I'll be making. And then I'd like to end by throwing the question to you about what are you seeing in emerging practices and, uh, and importantly, how does this link to one key area in the Accord review and that is what are the implications here for opening up uh, greater accessibility and um, increasing the participation rates of those from underrepresented demographic groups, those from equity groups uh, who are looking to participate. Uh, we might have some targets achieved in that area in, in uh, urban areas, for instance, but across the board in Australia, we still have a way to go to achieve those goals and the review will highlight that. So um, uh, I'll share with you the feedback in just a moment, but before I do, I just want to reiterate five principles, just so we're really clear about the fact that this is not a matter of telling universities or independent providers what to do, what criteria to set for admissions. This is about respecting the autonomy of providers, but f putting our students, our learners at the centre. So admissions transparency starts first and foremost with what is in the best interest of future learners. How do we make sure we provide them with information that is consistent, that is easily navigable? So it's student-centred, number one. Secondly, from a student and learner perspective, how do we facilitate um, the ability to compare? If I'm looking at courses and institutions, and if I don't have a great careers advisor or parents who, or, or uh, um, siblings who went to into a university or a higher education provider, how do I know what information to, to look for? And uh, the ability to compare courses and providers on a basic threshold level of, uh, of admissions information was a second principle. A third principle was very much about ease of accessibility. How do we help students, future learners, to navigate their way through a system when they do not have the social and cultural capital the, the know-how uh, in terms of understanding what admissions is all about, what do I need to be able to get in, what are my peers going to be like when I get into this course. So the admissions transparency focus was very much on uh, providing information to students. And uh, as I mentioned, a fourth principle, institutional autonomy. So what we're talking about here is not about telling you as providers what you need to uh, do in terms of establishing selection criteria, admissions criteria, but it's about gathering the information that you do have and putting it out there in, uh, in uh, as transparent a way as possible. And the final principle is about staged implementation. So what you see on this screen here is we went out to the sector to say, in addition to providing information for undergraduate students, is there a way for us to work together to get some level of consistent information that we could provide to postgraduate and international students? I have to say the feedback was uh, really impressive and I was quite overwhelmed by the level of detail and the rigour of the submissions that we received, 36 in all. Submissions from public universities, independent providers, um, our tertiary admission centres, the tax uh, students, particularly the Council of Australian Postgraduate uh, Students, their feedback was invaluable, and um, uh, peak, peak, peak bodies. So a, a very robust and comprehensive set of, of feedback. All of the feedback endorsed the principle of admissions transparency. So that's great. Big tick for that. We all want to be transparent. 
But when it comes to looking at how we provide that information, it becomes trickier. So my reading of the uh, submissions is uh, as follows. First of all, admissions transparency, we're all aiming for that. But there is a real challenge when we try to shoehorn information for postgraduate and international students into an existing table, an existing information set for undergraduate students. We're hearing loud and clear that, in fact, if we push too hard in that direction, we will achieve greater uh, opacity and, uh, and far less clarity. We will confuse future learners and, uh, and students, and um, we will add a, f a further administrative burden. But most importantly, thinking about future students, are we going to help or hinder? And the feedback on the postgraduate was, we recognise the importance of providing information for postgrad students, but there is such diversity, and uh, there are so many good practices already in, in institutions. Why not share those good practices uh, and, um, and work on it that way, rather than trying to um, just add more lines to an admission information set. So my recommendation is that we don't go back to the sector to say we want you to do things this way, we want to add more information to uh, what you already do. My recommendation to the Higher Ed Standards Panel and the Minister will be let's celebrate the emphasis on transparency but let's share the constructive suggestions that have been given and try to build up our capability as a sector that way rather than going back to an existing table and, and adding information. So that will be one recommendation I make. The second recommendation is around international students. Many of you will be aware that there has been a review of the ESOS legislation and we do expect that there will be reforms as a result of that. And rather than trying to retrofit uh, any changes that may take place and, uh, and go back over old ground, my recommendation will be let's get that ESOS work um, done. Let us make sure we make the most of existing data sources for international students uh, and let's use those avenues rather than changing the way in which uh, we already provide information for undergraduates. So that basically will be the advice and you'll be the first to know when, uh, when that advice is uh, relayed and, and what the outcome is. But basically, it's saying we are a very different sector to where we were six years ago. Let's keep doing what we do for undergraduate students to provide them with core information, but let us not try to go back and retrofit by adding information for postgrad and international students in the way that we did for undergraduate students. The ATAR is the next uh, segue into my last section, and that is we went out to you as a sector and said, we know discussions about ATAR-related uh, um, admissions is a very contested space. At one end of the spectrum, people are saying, ATAR, dead and buried, not relevant anymore. At the other end of the spectrum, we've got um, uh, accrediting authorities and, uh, and, in fact, some students, institutions saying, no, we still use ATAR, we find that really useful. And somewhere in between there, we've got to figure out how do we make sure that if ATAR is used, that there is a transparency about it. And uh, when we asked you whether you saw any scope for including more information in tables about uh, the ATAR that students come in with, even if ATAR was not the basis of admission, it was basically no. Please do not. Stop right there. Let us figure out what's really happening across the sector before we start adding more information. And, uh, and there is a lot of debate about the, the ways in which ATAR-related information, it can help, it can also hinder, it can discourage students, but it can also provide them with information about the cohort that uh, they may be studying with. So basically, the, the ATAR-related question um, led to commentary in your submissions that said, we would like greater transparency uh, around non-ATAR admissions pathways, right? We want to know what's really happening. And uh, we, there were a number of helpful suggestions, and that will inform 
the work that we do in the next phase um, of admissions transparency. And this is where you come in. So let me move through this to remind you that there are a lot of discussions around admissions at the moment. You only have to look in the media to see that uh, there is debate about the relevance of the ATAR. Here in Melbourne, Sandra Milligan at the University of Melbourne uh, is doing some great work. I know the VTAC is also looking closely at the relevance of the ATAR and how do we work in an ecosystem where some are using ATAR, some are not. Is the ATAR um, necessary at all? All sorts of questions are, are being thrown up in the air at the moment. At one end of the spectrum, as I said, some are still wanting ATAR to, uh, to be retained as, um, as a, a basis of admission, including students. At the other end of the spectrum, we've got people like uh, Verity Firth, who makes it clear the pandemic uh, has caused us to rethink, recalibrate, let us re-examine and, uh, and rethink the use of, um, uh, of admissions criteria like the ATAR. Interesting, as a segue from, uh, from Verity Firth's comments and um, this uh, Mitchell Institute report, even though this is a little bit dated, it uses 2016 data and it talks about the fact that there um, at that time was a growing disjunct and disconnect between what schools and, uh, and universities were saying and doing around the ATAR. Um, that has not changed. And um, what we're seeing here is um, from the Mitchell Institute perspective and, uh, and Verity Firth's comments, there is a very real message here around what are the implications for those who are least um, familiar with navigating their way through higher education admissions. And by that I mean equity groups who are underrepresented in higher education. And that I see as a close link to the, one of the key areas in the, um, uh, the review Accord. How do we increase um, participation rates and, uh, and accessibility of higher education? Interesting work happening around the country. This is but one example of what the, uh, in South Australia, what the Certificate of Education um, uh, f focus is looking at. How do we develop capability and learner profiles that uh, capture in a different way the capabilities that students um, are able to demonstrate after 13 years of education. So we're looking right across the spectrum of activities in the sector and, um, and there are other states doing equivalent work. And um, I'll end with this one. Greg Craven, as you know, has expressed views in the media over many years and, um, and once again just recently a focus on, in New South Wales, the use of the ATAR as an entry point into teacher education and strong views about the fact that it's no longer relevant. In New South Wales, we know the vice chancellors of the universities there. I was just talking to Barney Glover earlier this week about the fact that um, there's a close look on the new part of New South Wales universities at admissions practices. And that leads me then to the final phase of work, and that is uh, where we would really appreciate your input and help. We're about to kick off between now and uh, April next year a piece of work looking at what are the emerging practices. What has changed in the sector? And they may not necessarily be emerging. They might have emerged. Uh, I'm thinking here, for example, about the thing called early offers, for instance, or making offers on the basis of year 11 uh, results. We did a, a great turnaround during COVID. And the question now is, were the practices back then fit for, are they fit for, for the future, if you like? Are they going to stand us in good stead or do we need to go back to the way things were? Uh, is the ATAR dead and buried uh, or is it but one of multiple ways of admitting students? So the question that you see there is a question that the previous minister put to the higher ed standards panel. What are the emerging practices and um, what does the landscape look like? And importantly, what are the implications? And I've added that last bit there because in um, discussion with the current minister, and you only have to hear him speak uh, to know that his particular interest is in what are the practices uh, that um, are impede or inhibit and what are the practices that enable um, the greater participation of students from a range of, of diverse groups. And I would say this is one of the key outcomes. Um, but the problem is we don't have the full landscape picture. 
We do not have a national database of the range of, of practices in the sector. We do not have data on what are the retention and progression and, uh, and outcome um, rates for students who come in through a variety of entry pathways. So we really do need to crowdsource here, and uh, this will be um, a discussion we have with you as a sector. What are you seeing? Are there concerns? Are there opportunities to build on emerging practices? And um, I'll put this up now and then we'll take questions. What you'll see on the screen there is a, a way to contact me directly or in the department. Kirsty Douglas is the Secretariat Support for the Higher Education Standards Panel. Connect with me on LinkedIn if, you've, uh, if you want to have a chat about this. Basically, we will go out to the sector to ask that question what are you seeing in changing admission practices? Do you have data that helps to give confidence that these practices are fit for purpose, fit for future, and uh, actually enabling student progression and success? Do you have concerns and uh, are there risks you'd like to let us know about? So I'll stop there and uh, happy to take questions. Um, Barbara Weiss, Group of Eight, and very pleased with the recommendations that you're putting up. So thank you for sharing that. Oh, um, I guess I just wanted to make, maybe it's a little bit of a comment, that when we look at access, we also need to look at supports for what we do once we get students in. I think that's critical for this yep. next phase as well. Thanks. Um, it's OK to, imp we need to desperately improve access. But if we can't retain students and they're not succeeding, that's a fail. So true, Barbara, thank you. And uh, the more evidence we can have for, you know, what are the practices that help to increase likelihood of retention, what are the supports that go with it, spot on. Thank you. Another question? Got room for one more and then I'll have to uh, ask you to contact uh, Kerry Lee directly as she's openly invited you to do so. I have uh, indeed. Please uh, don't hesitate. I Any want questions? to hear. I want to hear all about it. <laughs> yeah. Look out. We'll, we'll count the number of uh, inputs you receive. That's right. I'll let you know. Yeah. Okay. No questions? Uh, there's a question uh, online. Ah. Do you want to take that? Right. So, so do we understand who the students are that support maintaining ATAR? In other words, is there a clear idea of a specific group who are for or against, for example, from a specific socioeconomic or other group? Um, and uh, a great question. Unfortunately, we are not that sophisticated um, as a sector. And, uh, as much as um, anything, we rely on the sorts of headlines I've just shared with you, right? And the data that um, uh, Mitchell Institute reported back in 2018, um, you know, we, we've got pockets of data, but we do not have a national picture. So I am making a a plea for having that national discussion and figuring out how we go about gathering data that helps us figure out, you know, where is there a place for ATAR? What purpose does it serve? Is it dead and buried? Uh, you know, I, I think it's a very contested space, but happy to hear your views. Last, Brett. Last question. Matt. Thanks, uh, Curly. It's uh, great to hear what's happening there. One, one of the questions posed in the consultation paper was around uh, transparency around allocation of uh, like scholarship CSP at postgraduate level. Just kind of wonder if there's any themes that came out from that, or is that sort of dead in the water now that uh, um, yeah, postgraduate sort of trans uh, admission transparency is is taking a back seat? Do you mean, uh, Matt, the um, information about Commonwealth supported places? Yes. Yeah, for postgrad. So um, it, we know that um, many institutions, universities in particular, have um, CSP, Commonwealth Supported Places, for postgraduate. The feedback we had was uh, we provide that information, right? No surprises there. I guess the question I have is, you know, how, how consistent is it? If I'm a, a student looking across providers, can I access that information easily? And, uh, and can I compare institutions based on the information available? I think there's work to be done there. So the, the final comment I'll make is um, there were some really helpful suggestions about how institutions are doing that. And what my recommendation is, is let's synthesize that and share that so that we um, uplift the whole sector with some good suggestions rather than 
making a blanket uniform requirement that actually isn't going to be fit for purpose. Okay, well, I need to cut you off at that point, Thanks, Kerry Lee. Thank you very much.